Good morning. For our call to worship this morning, I'd like to read from Psalms 150. It says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. <clears throat> Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We would like to welcome you to the Abernet Christian Church this morning. Some announcements that we'd like to highlight. Um, youth group will meet <clears throat> on Wednesday at 6 o'clock here at the church. Um, I'd like to thank Nathan, Charlie, Bill, Pam, and Mike for helping with the church work day. They got the uh, north side of the church all power washed and the west side of the church all power washed and around the entrance power washed. They got the parking lot cleaned up. They weed eated and they put some weed and feed on the grass. And so um, they got quite a bit accomplished and just wanted to thank them for doing that. They did an amazing job. Um, are there any other announcements that we want to mention at this time? We do have several people that are on the prayer list. If you'll notice on the prayer concerns, I've added a couple of people. I've added um, Pam Lubbin and David Lubbin. They are sister and brother to um, Janet Mosier. And uh, they both have issues that are going on there. I guess they are uh, siblings that never married. They um, are both living out at the old home place. And they've both kind of got issues that are kind of going on. And, and uh, Janet does kind of too. So uh, I talked to her for her and uh, Troy for quite a little bit this last week. Troy's going to have to go in. He's going to have to have some skin cancer removed off his ear. And uh, they just go in there and they take a layer at a time. And then they check and make sure that they go deep enough that they don't find anything else. So... Um, just might kind of keep all of those people in your prayers. Uh, I did have surgery on Tuesday. The surgery went well. The surgery, I think, lasted about 45 minutes. And I think in, I was in recovery for about 30 minutes. Um, I was awake probably 15 minutes after I got in there. And just the amount of paperwork for them to get me moved over. Um, and they, the uh, meniscus tear, they said, was an old injury. But they went ahead and they repaired that. They cleaned up some arthritis that was in there and trimmed up some of the tissue a little bit, cleaned up a little bit of the uh, irritation. But I kind of overdid it yesterday. So um, I'm kind of hobbling around today. And I guess the hard work really starts Tuesday when I start physical therapy with Todd. So um, that'll be probably the hard stuff. So uh, I appreciate your prayers and your thoughts and your concerns and um, just would appreciate you kind of keeping everybody that's on the prayer list in your prayers as well. There's got a, quite a list there. So if there aren't any others, yes, Pat. All right. Any others? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our great and our gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we are so grateful and thankful for all that you've done for us, for the way that you've blessed us and been so very good to us. And Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would just be with Pat as she prepares to go in for blood work this week, that the results would be good and that, Heavenly Father, she would get the answers that she's looking for. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful that you were with me through the uh, scoping of my knee and that everything went well with it. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you would just be with Pam and David as they each struggle with their own um, physical problems and difficulties that they have, that you would just be with Janet and her knee as she's struggling with it, and, and Troy and, and his uh, ear as he is going to have skin cancer removed there. Lord, we just have so many that need your very real and very special touch, and we just ask that you just move in a mighty way and that you bring victory to your people. We ask that you be with our service, that in it and through it, that you be honored and praised and glorified. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our first hymn this morning will be hymn number 93. And let's stand and we'll sing, oh, 4,000 tongues to sing all five verses. 93. <clears throat> thousand tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise the glories of my god and king 
the triumphs of His grace. Jesus, a name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, he sets a prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, His blood availed for me. Hear Him, ye deaf, His praise ye dumb, Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, And leap ye lame for joy. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. You may be seated. Our next hymn will be hymn number 555, When We All Get to Heaven, first, second, and fourth verse. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Then if you'll turn over to 453, we'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of It Is Well With My Soul. 453. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. 
it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Our communion meditation this morning is entitled In Prison and Lonely. Sherlock Holmes called them the agony columns. They are the personal ads which still appear in the newspapers and increasingly on various websites. A common one comes from someone who is an inmate seeking someone to write and perhaps to visit. Prison is a surprisingly lonely life. You are surrounded by thousands of sinners, each looking out for number one. You are therefore alone in a crowd. You dare not seek help for that betrays your weakness and you will be crushed. Surrounded yet completely alone. In such a life, the letter from outside is greatly prized. A visit is like a light in a dark tunnel. For most prisoners, these things are rare. There may be thousands of prisoners in the institution. A few dozen will get a visit. Letters are a little more common, but also rare. Those of us outside may say, well, it's your own fault. Stew in your own juices. That is usually true, but does nothing to comfort the lonely. In a sense, we should understand this. We are all prisoners on planet Earth. We, too, are surrounded by sinners who are admittedly more polite about it. And, if you will, it's your own fault, for we are sinners all. Our lives are no doubt more pleasant than that of the prisoner, but our chance of being lonely is still great. Consider that we trust our fellow sinners much more. When they fail us, the rejection and loneliness is even greater. We are serving a life sentence, no hope but death. But for the Christian, there is hope. Do we prize a letter from home? Yes, we have a whole Bible full of them. We have not been left alone. It is not the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, dwelling in us. We have not been left alone, but the great comfort comes at a communion. It is a visit from our Lord. He tells us, this is my body. There is greater hope than that. We celebrate this memorial until our Lord returns. It is then that the bars of death will be torn away. We shall see the end of tears and loneliness and celebrate indeed. Our communion hymn this morning is hymn number 372. We'll sing verses 1 and 2 and stand on the third verse. Jesus. 
Our dear precious Heavenly Father, we thank thee so much, dear Lord, for this time that you have granted to each one of us that we can come around this communion table. A table that you so wisely set for us, Lord. A time for us to give you thanks, Lord. A time for you, for us to ask for thy blessing, Lord. And a time to remember your son, Jesus, as he went to the cross and he sacrificed his life that our sins might be forgiven. We ask, Lord, that 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 our sins are forgiven, Lord. And we pray that you will give a, continue to help us to want to spread your word, the gospel, to everyone who will listen, Lord. We just pray, Lord, now as we, we come here around this table that you bless the emblems of this communion, Lord. Bless the loaf and the, and the cup that represents the flesh and the body of Jesus and his shed blood, the blood that was shed for us that our sins might be covered up. We ask you now, Lord, to bless each one. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray. Amen.
this morning, I want to look at a very interesting passage of Scripture that comes from 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Because I think that in this passage, we see something about the nature of God. So 2 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 9, reading from the New International Version, it says this, During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke with them. Now, the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul in his zeal for Israel and Judah had tried to annihilate them. David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make amends so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, We have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. What do you want me to do for you, David asked. They answered the king, As for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us, so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. He handed them over to the Gibeonites, who killed and exposed them on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together, and they were put to death during the first days of harvest, just as the harvest was beginning. Now, you may be asking, why is this passage of Scripture, why does that pique Dan's interest? Well, because this is not the first time that we've heard about the Gibeonite people. So, how many of you remember the other story about the Gibeonites? Any hands? Not seeing any? I'll, I'll help you remember. So, um, if you recall that when the Israelites come in to take the promised land, right? They, J- Joshua is leading them, and they have taken um, Jericho and Ai, and they've started to conquer the land. The Gibeonites decide that they cannot possibly win in an outright confrontation, a battle, with Israel. And so they try to deceive Israel instead. And so what they do is they take old, worn-out clothes and sandals and dry, crusty, moldy old bread and worn-out wineskins, and they come to the leaders of Israel and they say to them, we have traveled from way far, far away because we've heard about what a great people that you are. See, look at our provisions. This moldy bread was fresh out of the oven when we left. And this, our wineskins were brand new when we left to come see you. Look how old and worn out they are. We've, we've come from far away. Now make this peace treaty with us. And so the Bible says that even though the Gibeonites were their neighbors, right in the land that they were trying to conquer, The Israelite leaders, Joshua, the other leaders of Israel, never bothered to ask God about this decision that they were going to make, this peace treaty that was being offered to them. And so they made this peace treaty with the Gibeonite people only to find out that they had been deceived, that these guys actually lived like right next door. So, you know, here they've made this not so great decision. But, you know, they've, they've made a vow to God that they're going to protect these people, right? Well, all of the other people around, the Canaanites around them, find out that uh, they've made this peace treaty with the Israelite people, and they're like, fine, if uh, Israel's not going to wipe them out, we are. 
And so they all get together and they come to wipe out Gibeon, the Gibeonite people. And so guess what? They send their runners straight over to um, Joshua and say, Joshua, hey, remember that treaty you made with us? You need to come protect us right now because all these guys want to kick the snot out of us, right? And so at that point, it would have been super easy for the Israelite leaders to say, you know what? We screwed this thing up. We should have asked God. We didn't do it. We're just going to turn our head and just ignore this whole situation and it'll take care of itself. But that's not what they did, is it? They did exactly what they said they were going to do. And they marched all night and they got there. And because they were obedient to their oath, we get one of the most interesting stories in all of the Old Testament. One of only two times in all of Scripture where the Bible says that time was modified. Because as they are fighting, they, uh, the battle is going in the way that Israel needs it to go. They're winning, but they don't have enough time to defeat their enemies. And so Joshua prays for the sun to stop and the moon to stand still. And the Bible says that it did so for about an entire day. There's only one other time where we find anywhere in Scripture where t- the, the progression of time was modified. And that was with King Hezekiah when he is ill and he asks, God says he's going to give him a sign. And he asks if he wants the, the sun to move ahead so many steps on the, on, or backwards. And Hezekiah's like, I've always seen it go forward. I want to see it go backwards, right? So um, because they were obedient, God does this fantastic miracle. He He causes hailstones to fall from heaven that kills more of the people than even the Israelites killed, right? And so we have this amazing story about the Gibeonite people. Even though they deceived Israel, God held them to their word to protect them, right? Now we find that years later, Saul, in his zeal to be popular among the the Israelite people, sought to annihilate the Gibeonite people, to put them to death. And David, you know, is trying to be king, and he has three consecutive years of famine. And he's like, what is going on? And so he inquires of the Lord, and the Lord says, it's because uh, of the bloodshed that Saul did. He broke the covenant that Joshua and those leaders made with the Gibeonite people. And so that brings us to our first point. Saul broke the oath that Israel had made. Saul broke the oath. That Israel had made. It says, During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, It's on account of Saul and his blood stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them. But Saul and his zeal for Israel and Judah had tried to annihilate them. Now, Here's what I find is really interesting. Did God telegraph, did he advertise that this three years of famine was because of what Saul had done? Nope. All that happened was we didn't get no rain this year. And the next year we didn't get any rain. And the third year, we didn't get any rain. It wasn't until David actually sought the Lord that he found out what the reason for the famine was. Are you with me here? Who is to say that some of the crazy things that have been happening in our world and in our nation is not God trying to get our attention. 
Except nobody is bothering to ask God, hey, is this from you? Is there a reason for this? Clearly, in Scripture, God uses events to try and get people's attention. This is just one of them. And we can either ignore them, or we can say, hey, is there a problem here that we need to fix? Another thing that I see in here is that God takes the oaths and the things that we say very seriously. God takes the oaths and the things that we say very seriously. <clears throat> in Joshua chapter 9, verses 16 through 19, so this goes kind of back to that first story that I was telling you about the Gibeonites. Three days after they made the treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their cities. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. But all the leaders answered, We have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. Now, today, if that had been a contract, we would have said that that was not done in good faith, right? And we would nullify the contract. Did God let them nullify the oath that they made to the Gibeonite people? He did not. Even though they had been deceived, God held them to the oath that they had made. God's serious about the things that we say. And so, you know, when, when Saul, years later, decides that he's going to get rid of the Gibeonite people, God said, you can't do that. There's consequences for that. I look at some of the things that we have done in our nation. And it causes me to tremble. It seems like we're so upside down in some of the things that we are doing. The, the rioting that's taking place. What happened to George Floyd was wrong. And the people that did that should have to answer for that. But does that give people the right to blind government officers with lasers who are trying to protect government property? Does that give them the right to hurt and to kill police officers who are nowhere near Minneapolis when the George Floyd incident happened? I saw a video of where a guy took, a police officer is trying to get into his cruiser and they throw, it looked, it was a disc of some kind, it almost looked like a trash can lid and hit the police officer in the back of the head. The police officer falls onto the ground, and he was simply trying to get into his cruiser, and people are cheering. What is wrong with a society where we cheer the people that try to protect us when they're hurt? What has happened to us as a nation there are good police officers and there are bad police officers. There are good people and there are bad people. And I don't care what color the, their skin is. I don't care what their occupation is. I don't care, you know, what their uh, religious affiliation is. There are good people and there are bad people. And we should, we should you know, um, approach people based off of their behavior, not based off of the blanket of what one person has done. And yet, that's exactly what we are doing as a nation. There, there are 
um, organizations that are out there that are promising even more uh, bigger riots if the elections don't go the way that they want them to go in November. So what they're basically saying is the will of the people doesn't matter, only what I want. What happened to democracy? What happened to the republic where the majority of the people choose who's going to lead us? But if I can't have the guy that I want, I'm going to riot in the streets? What does that say about us as a nation? What does it say about us as a nation where um, we'll throw people in jail for walking on our grass when we don't want them to be there? But unborn children who have no voice at all, we can, we can terminate them in the third trimester of pregnancy? What does that say about us as a nation? And it causes me to tremble because if God was willing to judge Israel based off of what Saul did, then that means that he can do the same thing to us as a nation and as a people as well. God takes the things that we say seriously. In 2 Timothy 11-13, through 13, it says this, This teaching is true. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we accept suffering, we will also rule with him. If we refuse to accept him, he will refuse to accept us. And then I've underlined this last part. If we are not faithful, he will still be faithful because he cannot be false to himself. Even when we choose to act in ways that are not so good, it doesn't change who God is in the way that he acts. God's going to continue to do what's right. Thirdly, God punished Israel for what Saul had done. God punished Israel for what Saul had done. 2 Samuel 21.1 it says, during the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord, and the Lord said, it's on account of Saul and his blood-stained house, because he's put the Gibeonites to death. I find it interesting that God held the entire nation accountable, not just Saul's house, not just Saul's family. Decisions that we make have consequences. And sometimes the reach of those consequences cannot be seen when we first make those decisions. What Saul did in order to make the Israelite people happy caused a three-year a three famine. And, and we don't know how long it would have gone had David not sought to correct it. God had removed his blessing and had instituted his justice and his judgment because of what Saul had done. And that also ought to give us pause because if that is true of Israel, then the decisions that our leaders make in our nation not only impact us politically, but they can impact us spiritually. You know, if, if I um, elect somebody into office that wants to raise my taxes, that's going to affect me in my wallet, right? I mean, it's going to have impact on me. Um, for example, some of the areas of the United States they uh, governors have said, you cannot do this. You cannot do that because of the pandemic, right? The people that they selected for office is affected them, their everyday living, right? But what I'm getting at here is that the people that we choose to put in office can affect us spiritually as well. The decisions that we, the people that they, we put into office, the decisions that they make, can affect God's blessing or God's judgment on our nation. 
And I think that's something that we don't think about very often. In that regard, I submit to you that elections matter. And I'm not telling you who to vote for. I'm telling you that when you vote, you need to look at the candidates and say, how do they square to God and his standard and what his word has to say? I'm not talking about it from a political perspective. We all have differences on how we think things should happen politically. My biggest concern is, how do these candidates square with Scripture? Because God is very clear on things like abortion. God's clear on things like, you know, lying, corruption. And if we purposely choose candidates that we know have those issues, you know, God may very well choose to withhold his blessing. And I don't think that that's something that we want as a nation. Fourthly, God did not relent until restitution was made. God did not relent until restitution was made. So when David went and to the Lord and said, God, why are we having this famine? And God said, well, it's because of Saul and what he's done to the Gibeonite people. Um, that didn't end it. That did not end the famine, Right? Just the fact that they knew why it was happening did not cause it to stop. David wasn't able to say, well, we're sorry about that. Please forgive us. And then God said, cool, let's go back to normal, right? Didn't work that way. In 2 Samuel 21, 11 through 14, it says, When David was told what Ai's daughter at Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done. So let me, let me back up here a little bit because... We didn't have time for all of the scripture that went with this story. So when David finds out that Saul broke the oath that Israel had made, that Joshua and the leaders of Israel had made with the Gibeonite people, and that was the cause of the famine, Saul, or David then goes to the Gibeonite people and he says, what do we need to do to fix this? And the Gibeonites say, Give us seven of Saul's descendants. We'll put them to death, and then we're good. And so David does that. Um, he, he spares Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was uh, Jonathan's son, and he had made a promise to take care of Mephibosheth to, um, to Jonathan. It's interesting that in Saul's family, there was a second Mephibosheth. That seems like a really odd name to have like multiples of. I'm not sure what the deal is there. But, um, and so he gathers up seven of Saul's male descendants and they're put to death and they are left out there on display. And so the mother of some of these kids, goes out there. She keeps the birds away, keeps the wild animals away, puts on sackcloth for mourning, makes sure that nothing is able to desecrate, you know, the bodies of these dead people. And so that kind of picks us up here in this story in 2 Samuel 21, 11. So when David was told of what Aya's daughter, Rizpah, Saul's concubine had done, he went and he took the bones of Saul and his son, Jonathan, from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. Now, that is a completely other story. Because remember, the Philistines kill Saul and Jonathan, and they put him up on, they leave him up, and some of some warriors go and they get the body of, of Saul and Jonathan, and they, they take him back, but they've never been properly buried. Okay, so David goes and he gets the bones of Saul and Jonathan that have never been properly buried. They had been taken sec secretly from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them after they struck Saul down at Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed, the seven descendants, were gathered up. 
they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zelah and Benjamin and did everything the king commanded. And after that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. It wasn't until restitution was made and everything was taken care of that God finally said, okay, we're cool now. Sometimes just saying sorry is not enough. Sometimes you have to make it right. And that's not popular in America today. We want to just be able to say, I'm sorry, and then to move on. But in this particular case, sorry was not just good enough. It required restitution. It required an action to make it right. And then finally, we also need to take our O's and our vows seriously. We need to take our O's and our vows seriously. In Matthew 5, 34 through 37, I'll remind you that it is Jesus who himself is saying this. This isn't just somebody off the street. This is actually Jesus who is saying this. He says, but I tell you, never swear an oath. Don't swear an oath using the name of heaven because heaven is God's throne. Don't swear an oath using the name of earth because the earth belongs to God. Don't swear an oath using the name of Jerusalem because that is the city of the great king. Don't even swear by your own head because you cannot make one hair on your head become white or black. Say only yes if you mean yes and no if you mean no. If you say more than yes or no, it is from the evil one. And what Jesus there is saying is saying, be careful about what you say because God is listening. I think that probably every single one of us has at times been careless with our words. And we don't think much about it. God is paying attention, and he's going to hold us accountable for the things that we say. And so it's important that the things that we say are things that we truly mean. Last week, we talked about the tongue. And this week, we're talking about O's, you know, promises that we're making. It's important that what we, we say what we mean and that we mean what we say, that we're men and women of our word. And that if we say something, that we do it, even if it costs us. I find it interesting, this particular story particularly interesting, because even though that promise had been made years earlier by different people, God still considered it to be in effect years and years later. Because remember, now, um, Joshua made that with the, with the leaders of Israel, right? So after Joshua, we go through all of these judges. We go through, um, you know, all kinds of judges, and the last judge is Samuel. So it isn't like it's just been 10 years, since this promise was made. It's been a lot of years have gone by before Saul ever becomes king. And God still held them to what they had promised. Even though it wasn't Saul who had made the promise himself. That should probably give us one more thing that we should consider. And that is that it's important to know what is here because if Saul had paid more attention to what had been in here, his seven sons, or seven descendants probably might have never died. Do, Do you follow what I'm saying? Whether or not Saul remembered that Joshua had made that oath to the Gibeonite people. God held him to it. You you follow what I'm saying? If that is true in the Old Testament, then it's important that we know what's in here so that we don't do the same thing. 
God takes the things that we say very seriously. This morning, if you have a decision that you'd like to make, we invite and encourage you to come as we sing our invitation hymn. Our invitation hymn this morning is hymn number 377. And let's stand and we'll sing the first and the final verse. I've wandered far away from God, now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home. Coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick, my heart is sore. Now I'm coming home, my strength renew, my hope restore, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. Father God, as we once more approach your throne, we just thank you so much for this day that you've given to us. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you are faithful and that even when we are sometimes unfaithful, you remain faithful. Heavenly Father, help us to be committed to the things that we say that we will do. Help us, Lord, to um, serve you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. Help us to love you and to look forward to the day when we can spend the rest of eternity with you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.